Part of it, I guess, we can get started with the second part. I'm going to talk from about right here, so if you want to turn a little bit, then I'm in the camera well, or you can slide over and, and move a chair. You were talking about angels, and one thing about angels is that angels aren't male or female, because male or female is a property of material bodies. And angels don't have material bodies, they have their spiritual creatures. But that doesn't mean they aren't masculine or feminine, that some of them don't have characteristics that we associate in one direction or another, but just that kind of, they don't really have a gender because gender belongs to material things. Just like God doesn't really have a gender. We refer to God as Father because that's how he taught us to refer to him that he describes his love very much like a father's love. Um, and there are passages in the Old Testament, actually, where a lot of the words used for the love of God are feminine words. Um, a number of them relate to women breastfeeding and like just that kind of tender mercy, giving yourself to the other person in a very kind of visceral, physical way. That there is language like that in the Old Testament, but it is interesting that the scriptures don't refer to God as mother. You know, that there, so there is this feminine language, um, but, you know, there's kind of a balance. It is important to remember that even though we call God Father, it means in a way that his love is like the perfection of fatherhood more so than he's a guy. Like, big old man with white beard, mm, probably not. Um, so, one of the things that we can begin with, I did make a whole new pot of tea, so there's plenty. You can drink a lot. Um, and I was going to show you, this is what the leaves look like. So most oolongs come rolled, and I'm told that they look a lot like marijuana, actually. <laughs> I wouldn't know what marijuana looks like, but... What did you say? I said I thought that looked familiar. No! Why do you know that? Who comes out? Jealous? Jealous? <laughs> this is what they look like when they're rolled. They're like rolled into these little these little balls. And then if you look at the if you look at the leaves when they unfurl, like if you look at the if you look at the bag, like there's actual like their whole leaves. Oh yeah. Oh, so they're super tightly. Yeah, they they kind of steam them and roll them together, but when they get um, unfurled, they look like. Come on. Oh sure. I mean, they're actual leaves. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And this is also why you shouldn't use tea balls, because they don't have room to unfurl yeah. like this. Oh, yeah. And that's part of what helps release their flavors and like the stuff in them that's good. And so if you scrunch it all in a tea ball, it, it's not able to like expand like that. Um, so you can see, I put just a little bit of them in there and it turned into, you know, that. Now they do get, it takes a couple of good steepings for them to develop and to unfurl fully, but uh, yeah. And oolongs are between a black and a green. Some of them are darker and some of them are greener. This one's kind of in the middle. Um, and like I said, it's one of my favorites. This one is actually really good if you get a little British feeling and add a little bit of creamer to it. This is a really, really good tea to drink that way. We begin with the third summary. Um, it talks about signs and wonders. And this is one of the things that I think I want to emphasize because it's an easy point to miss. I have to find a place to set my tea down. And it's not on the camera. That's too bad. Maybe I'll bring it. Yeah, chairs won't work. I could move this. Must be smarter than the average bear. Um, it talks about many signs and wonders. And one thing that I would encourage you to pick, up on the, to pick up on in a phrase like this is that it's actually telling you a lot of stuff that's not written. 
because it talked about people coming to the apostles to hear them and that they're doing many signs and wonders, many miracles of grace are being performed. How many of them are narrated? None at this point. But it, it's telling you, and they do this about the life of Jesus too. They'll give these massive summaries and it's like, wait a minute, you just described like six months of stuff. Like Jesus will preach in one spot or heal in one spot and then it'll say, he did this in all the synagogues of Galilee. Well, remember that they're walking. They don't have cars. You know, if he spends a day or two in each town, that's months of journey. And it described it in like these two little tiny lines. <laughs> so I think it's important just to feel kind of the weight of that, that the apostles are these things that like the miracle that Peter did in healing the man who was crippled at the doorway of the temple that probably happened many times over. There's a lot more in the story that's in the background and not being mentioned directly. Um, and unfurls? But to be honest, this is, these are the kinds of places where I wonder how fundamentalist Protestants handle this because it's telling us that there's all kinds of important things that aren't written down in the book. You know, it's telling us that there's this whole apostolic life that's happening that's not recorded in the story. I think we talked about that last time, like they're breaking bread, they're celebrating a sacramental life, they're gathering for prayer, they're going to synagogue, they're studying in each other's homes, they're taking care of the poor, some of them are selling properties and bringing money. Like, that's, that's the milieu, that's the story, or that's the landscape in which this story is taking place. And there you have this, these times in the scriptures where it sort of pulls back out of the story and it sort of re-narrates or talks about the lay of the land and the landscape. And that, I think, is part of the richness of it. Because, you know, you could be praying with the book of Acts and I would encourage you to pray with these texts to really try and grab onto it and pray with it. Let's say you're praying and imagining it and you imagine a miracle or a scene that isn't in the scriptures. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. Now it doesn't mean just because you imagine it, it did. We imagine lots of things and sometimes maybe they're real and sometimes it's a message, but that there's, there's this landscape of grace. You know, did Jesus appear to some of them? Maybe. There's a lot more healings that are taking place than the ones that they talk about. They're together of one mind and one heart. I think that's a really beautiful phrase. In a way, it's kind of talking about them a bit like the truth of marriage, that in marriage, the two are supposed to become one. And you know that it has to be much more than physically sharing the same space. You can physically share the same space with a lot of people, but love and true marriage is different. And sometimes marriage feels more like that. Sometimes it's like, okay, I'm existing next to you. Like, you know, we're like ships passing in the night. We're not really acting like married people. We need to fix this. Let's go on a date or let's do something special. You know, those kind of things are important for real love because, you know, if you, you can exist next to squirrels and mice too you want to think about it but I don't so there aren't any mice around they're all dead um, I put a picture up because it talked about them meeting in Solomon's portico and if I don't know I was reading along at this and it's like what on earth is Solomon's portico it's kind of this big thing now this is an artist's rendition but it's not like a small place. This was a colonnade, a set of double columns that was covered that ran all the way along the top of the Temple Mount. Now, part of it ends up being called the Antonia Fortress, and that was taller and bigger, and that was a Roman fortress on one end. And then there was another part that had several stories. But it's, it's not a small place. It's probably the only building of this size in ancient Jerusalem by far, like dramatically bigger than anything else that people had seen. Um, so this I think also speaks to, they're not afraid to meet in Solomon's portico. 
that's part of the temple ground, but they're not afraid to meet there because it says they gathered there often and it's one of these summaries. So it doesn't necessarily mean they met there every day, but that this was a place where they were known because it's recorded in the text. Some are afraid to join them. Some of the people are cautious about it. There's difficulty, there's foment, there's things happening in the background. The opposition of the authorities is increasing. Um, some people don't want to be seen. Remember the story of Nicodemus, who was a secret believer for much of the life of Jesus. Traditionally, he becomes Saint Nicodemus by the end because he sort of comes out of the woodwork, but it took him a while. Some people are a little bit like that. They're a little bit more on the outside. There are many new believers. I want to make sure that I'm talking about these things well. None of the others dared to join them. There's a question about who the others are. Like, is the others the apostles? Is the others people that they were preaching to? I think the text is ambiguous and we don't really know. But I think that it's talking about this division that there's some fear on the part of one group of people that's hearing them, but the message isn't convicting them in the same way. They're not in the same spot yet. Many other people are believing in them. I mean, remember that sometimes we get a bad picture of ancient Jews and like that they're all grouchy and stuffy and all the Pharisees are angry or they're all pharisaical and hypocrites and those kind of things. But that's just not true. Many of them became early Christians. And some of them were probably just faithful practicing Jews who were there at the time and living their faithful Jewish life, not too different than, than we are now. And they were trying to make do and trying to survive the Romans and trying to pay their taxes and not you know, sweat too many bullets over the tax forms or whatever it is, all those kinds of things. Like, there is a leadership that is opposed, but it's not necessarily the majority. It may not even be a significant minority, that it could be a fairly small group of people. But we have, we get lots of this impression, I don't know, from movies and pictures and things that there's this massive opposition to Christianity. And the crescendo is going to increase. That's definitely true. It, it's going to reach a fever pitch in a few chapters with the death of Stephen. But it's important to hear that many people are believing. Many people are becoming Christians. Many of them are being baptized and receiving the sacraments and joining the community. The sick are healed even by the shadow of Peter. You know, it's interesting that in the story of the Acts of the Apostles, Peter is singled out first. And it's not like Peter's the boss, Peter's in charge, Peter, 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 right? It hasn't said anything about him being the boss yet. It's just telling the story about him. That's kind of a fascinating way of going about it. And I think it speaks to his role in the community that he is one of the people that Jesus entrusted with authority. Certainly, I don't want to undermine that, but it's just, it's not saying it directly, it's telling his story. Um, they carried the sick. The people are excited about healing, but I think someone mentioned that they may be kind of desperate. I feel like they might not all be there for the right reasons. I mean, imagine if you're a parent of a child who's suffering you know, and a faith healer comes and it's like, well, what if this is a person? What if God would choose to heal my child through this person? You know, and maybe they're going to preach at Fargo Baptist or maybe, you know, maybe it's going to be somewhere else. But there's a lot of people that would go. And let's say that this, a person like this, a preacher comes to Fargo and he prays with 50 people and 20 of them are healed. And he announces, next week, I'm going to be here and praying again. I would suspect that if you're a parent and you have a kid with issues, that, you know, hey, we're going to this church tonight. I don't want to. I don't care. 
you know, that there would be this kind of desperation that healing tends to be a little bit like throwing gasoline on the fire. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. That could be the way that some people encountered the grace of God first. But I think that it just is important to realize, to kind of humanize the situation again, because not everyone there was like, oh yes, I'm going to sit here quietly while you tell me about God. And then I'm going to remember everything that you said. You know, some of them were probably coming and, you know, they're so desperate that they're even like, even if we don't get to talk to Peter, just so that he walks by and your shadow, his shadow falls across you. Like, in a way, that's a beautiful statement of faith, but in a way that also speaks a lot to their desperation, that they're just sort of crowding around them and, you know, clogging up the uh, walkways of ancient Jerusalem and, you know, those kinds of things. If you've ever been in a building with way too many people, it's actually not a lot of fun. In the modern world, we're much more used to having space. And it's not always that way. I mean, when I was in Jerusalem, it was a Jewish feast. And there were like hundreds of thousands of Orthodox Jews. And there were roads that there were just people walking on and kind of walking back and forth. But there were so many people trying to walk that you were like smashed in and you couldn't move. You couldn't go forward and you couldn't go back and you couldn't go sideways because everyone else around you couldn't move either. And you had to just wait there for a while like, okay, it's all right. <laughs> just breathe. But it's, we're not, we're not used to those kinds of crowds. And there were times where it was a little bit uncomfortable, like, okay, you guys go down that road, I'll find another way. <laughs> like, yep, there's too many people in there. See you later. Um, there aren't medical hospitals at this time. Remember that there's a lot of sick people because there's not really a lot of people to take care of them. Sometimes people got abandoned very easily. That hospitals really came about through the work of Christians. They were relatively unknown in the world before the advent of large-scale Christianity, the sick were just sort of the evolutionary leftovers that got thrown out. And it's tragic. I mean, it, it's extremely sad, but that's what it was. Um, and I think it's a great place to ask, like, what are you looking for? Right? There's times where all of us seek Jesus as a healer. And, you know... We're darn ready to kneel down and pray for hours and hours and hours to get something we want or for a healing that we're looking, you know, that we're asking for, for someone who's sick. And again, this isn't to downplay that. Like, that's okay. People ask sometimes, well, can I pray about who wins the Super Bowl? And it's like, sure. Because in my mind, prayer and contact with God is a good thing. And maybe you do start praying for who wins the Super Bowl but maybe you end by going to heaven. I mean, there's people who will end up saved because they liked a cute girl that went to church. <laughs> right? There's people that are saved because like, well, shoot, I married this guy and he likes going to church and so I better come along. You know, that kind of thing can be very real and that's okay, it's, it's not a bad thing. Sometimes that's the place where people meet Jesus. There might be people that are saved because you offered to take them out for pizza afterwards. Um, and so I think there is that, but it's also important to recognize that if their intention isn't right, it doesn't mean to downplay it or to attack them, but sometimes it's like, there's a whole lot more to this Christianity thing than just getting pizza every week. <laughs> you know, like, yes, we can feed you, but you should meet this God that we know about and love and follow because there's more to the story. So it's okay to start somewhere, but sometimes it's also this invitation to grow. And I think that's what's happening with a lot of these crowds. Like they're coming. It sounds like this almost crazy, panic-stricken, you know, when doctors can't do anything and medical science is relatively worthless and they hack holes in people and let them bleed for a while, healing would be a pretty big deal. And people might not be very rational about it. So then it. Stronger believer, too. So if you know you're not well, or somebody you love's not 
well. And then you are healed. I mean, sometimes I think there's a lot of miracles that happen that sometimes we're like, oh, but yeah, it was the medicine or it was the visit to so and so. And maybe it's right. really more than that. Yeah. And for believers, I think that's one of the most amazing things. Like when you have faith and you believe that God can work and you're praying for things, sometimes I think you do see people healed more directly. Sometimes you see people who find the right doctor to diagnose them or the right person or their surgery goes well or they recover faster. And like you said, those become incidences that encourage your faith. Like, wow, God really answered my prayers. For people on the outside or people that are approaching it without faith, it's like, ah, oh, your prayers are worthless, you know? It was a doctor, it was this medicine, it was this, it was that. But there are people, I mean, one of the great stories was a deacon in Grand Forks named John Brademeyer. His wife had a massive stroke, um, I suppose when she was in her 50s. And she was like, uh, everywhere woman, manage finances, taxes for people, on and on and on and on. And she had this massive stroke and almost died and was in the hospital. And I think she lost the ability to speak. She lost the ability to walk. She was in rough straits. And she got good care and improved. But then years later, like when I was up in Grand Forks and she was still alive, she died while I was there rather suddenly. But she was continuing to improve years later when medical science basically gave up hope on her. I mean, she'd gotten, she got her speech back, she could carry on conversations. I mean, she was getting more and more back all the time. It was like her body was continuing to heal. And Deacon John would say about her, it's not just one miracle, it's like dozens by this point. Like, she continues to far exceed any possibility that the medical doctors gave her. And so, like you said, I mean, for him, it was a huge boost to his faith. Um, for people on the outside, they would, well, maybe, you know, people recover after strokes and it's just, yeah, whatever. Medical science isn't exact. I mean, you could see the dividing line of how big of a difference faith makes in some of those situations. Um, so then it talks about the jealousy at work in the Sanhedrin and the leadership. And this, I think, is, is really important. Because what's interesting, maybe let's just flip to the chart, because I put a lot of this stuff together in this chart. Because you kind of have different groups of people at work. And as I was reading through it, it was like, wait a minute, I just want to organize some of my thoughts, thus the chart. And so you have the apostles and the church and the believers. That's kind of one group. And then you have the Jewish leadership that's sort of upset and grouchy, and that's another group. And then you have the crowds that are being preached to. That's a third group. So the apostles are preaching with boldness. They're out there, they're praying, miracles are happening. They're excited. It talks about them being filled with joy and wonder and love. They're teaching people about Jesus. People are encountering God. They're being healed. And note at the beginning of the next story, Where's the Jewish leadership? They're sitting in the Sanhedrin and brooding over the problems that are going wrong. They're the Jewish leadership. They could be preaching in the temple. They could be asking God to heal people. They could be out there doing almost the same thing that the apostles are doing. But do you kind of feel the weight of the contrast? Like, the apostles are you know, praising God and living and moving. And you have this other group and they're in the background and they're scheming and they're planning. They're looking at this, not how can we be better at what we're doing? Not how are we convicted about our need to go out and to praise God and to pray? Not we want, we're excited that more people are encountering God and they're doing it in the temple. I mean, arguably that's a very Jewish thing that you would think they could feed on but they're actually in the background, you know, sort of staring with hungry eyes at it. How can we kill this? How can we stop it? How can we slow it down? Sometimes this happens to Christian ministries today. The Christians all start getting jealous about each other. And we're living in a better and better world for evangelization because it's like, hey, y'all don't need to fight over here because all of them don't go to church. 
there's a large group of people over here that you can have fair pickings at. <laughs> um, but you kind of have to feel the weight of it. And this was a really helpful thing for me because you're reading along in the story and just to map it out, like the apostles are out, they're in the streets, they're proclaiming, like that's the atmosphere. You can imagine joy and like a big celebration, a block party. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees, or at least the Jewish leadership, sort of back in their room, in their meeting room, doors shut, afraid, cautious, jealous. I mean, that's a pretty striking contrast. And that's what the story sets up. And then you have the crowds who are traveling for miles around. They're coming from the towns around Jerusalem. They're probably seeking healing. Some of them are probably curious. What are they saying? Who is this God? What are they talking about? Some of them are genuinely interested. They're genuinely convicted about the truth of it. And the, it's probably this whole scattering of intentions and desires and abilities and what's happening. You see the apostles and this transformation that's happening in their lives. At the end of the story of Jesus, they're afraid. They don't want to confront the Jews. They run away. They abandon him. They reject even knowing him. Now, they're like, bring it on. And I don't think, I, I think it's important to kind of keep in perspective. I suspect that there's times where they're still afraid. Like the grace of God is powerfully at work. They ha do have a gift of the Holy Spirit. But for things to become a stable habit and become easy, you have to choose them a lot. And I think the apostles get there because in lots of moments like this, when they're being pressured, when the Pharisees and the Jewish leadership is coming after them, they choose to put their trust in Jesus and their trust in what they're seeing and what's happening, even if they feel afraid. And eventually, if you do that a lot, you do start to feel less afraid. But I don't think that happened in the beginning. My suspicion is that they felt like it was a little bit more white knuckles, touch and go, like, well, Jesus, you said you would save us. Like, now is the time of salvation. <laughs> we have been arrested. <laughs> And, and I think that it's just important to keep that in perspective. Like grace is at work and transformation is at work, but it's probably not complete yet. And the reason why I suspect that is because they talk about it. There's, there's instances where you'll hear Paul say, like I work out my salvation in fear and trembling. And people are like, oh, well, it's St. Paul and he's just so holy. Like the first time I was shipwrecked would probably be the last time I was shipwrecked. I don't think I'd get on a boat again. You know, but by the third time you get shipwrecked, it's like, Lord, go pick on someone else. You know, getting bit by a snake? Like, no, thank you. Not on my list of evangelization desires. You know, and Paul talks about having to sort of fight with himself and discipline himself and overcome his tendencies. And I think it's the same for the apostles. Um, the Jewish leadership isn't seeking God. That's one of the most glaring issues in the story. The apostles are praising God and praying like, Lord, what do you want us to do next? Fill us with boldness. You know, move in our hearts and in our lives. And the Pharisees and the Jewish leadership are all talking to each other. Like it's a circular thing. And it's like, you're the Jewish leadership. You should be talking to God, you should be directed toward him, and they're not. Nowhere in the story do they stop and pray. Nowhere in the story do they stop and seek the will of the Lord. Like, God, what are you doing? Again, that's a, that's a contrast. The apostles go out early in the morning, it says. So they're out there early in the morning. They get freed by the angel from prison and they go back out early in the morning. Some of us would be like, thank you, Lord. I was in prison. I think I need a little bit of beauty rest. Like I'm kind of tired, but they're so convicted about the message. But what's interesting in the literary detail is that the Sanhedrin doesn't convene until well into the morning. 
And they do, and they're like, okay, well, go get them, and the soldiers go to get them, and then they find the doors locked, and then they don't find any apostles inside. And then they come back and they tell them, the apostles are not here. The men you arrested are gone. Where did you put them? <laughs> You're in charge of the jail. Like, right? Like that. But it's like they're slow, they're lollygagging, there's no excitement, there's no like burning desire. They're just sort of going along with the flow. And so again, even in the story, you can feel the contrast of these literary details. Like the apostles are like, you know, kids on Christmas morning, like, mom, 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 it's after midnight. Like it is Christmas day. It's three in the morning, go back to bed. No, it's Christmas, it's presents. Like, come on, get out of bed. You know, that's what the apostles are like. And the Pharisees are like, no, I'm sleeping until nine, go away. <laughs> And so even, like, just paying attention to the details of the story, I think gives you a lot of insight into what it's trying to tell you. I think that's an exciting thing. But they're, they're also debating. They have a debate. They're debating with each other. And again, I think there's redemption here. It's not that they're all set against them right away. There's some strong voices that are jealous and are like, we need to kill them now. But there's other people that are pushing back against it and noticing what God is doing. They're, you know, they do see the miracles, they do see the healings. Um, the apostles and the church see Jesus as the Lord and Messiah. They see him alive and at work and living and moving and active and powerful. The Jewish leadership sees Jesus as a political rival. Who's going to have sway over the hearts of the people? He's going to create problems with Rome. Oddly enough, do the Christians create the problems with Rome? No, the Jews do, historically. The Jewish leadership eventually gets sort of caught up in this revolt against Rome, and the Romans come and slaughter like a million of them in Jerusalem. It was a pretty bloody and ugly struggle. But they see Jesus as a political rival. They play political games, and eventually when you play political games, you end up at the bottom of the wheel of fortune and you're out of luck. I guess what you assume is, like, so God is at both, right? Like, the Jewish leadership, surely they may not be seeking him out, but that's the overall word where other people see. But as a person looking in, you see, hey, both of these people are talking about God, but these guys are acting and they're doing things and they're moving. And here, these guys are just all words, no action. And just do as I say, not as I do. And yes, yes. So, so the Jewish, like, yeah, yep. It's almost like the dichotomy of. Yes, the Jewish leadership does seem to be in a very different place than the early apostles in the church. And I think when you feel that, that is a really good thing. Like, that's important as you're reading the story to kind of pull out that kind of movement and that kind of tension.